Thank you. It's lovely to be here at TEDx Brighton. Um, my project is Mappiness. Um, as it says on our website, Mappiness exists to map happiness across space in the UK. Um, and it does that for a particular purpose. We're particularly interested to find out how people's happiness or well-being is affected by their local environment. What I'm going to talk about in the next few minutes is the context of this, so the economics of well-being and the environment, how mappiness works, who's taking part in it, and what we're finding out, which is just a, a sneak preview of, of some of our early findings. Throughout this talk, and throughout lots of talks on, on this general subject, um, I'm going to use all of these words more or less interchangeably. It's not ideal, but you should, you should think of all of these as meaning pretty much the same thing. So subjective well-being, happiness, life satisfaction, and experience utility, because everyone else uses them that way. So first, very, very quick introduction to the economics of subjective well-being. Um, and you may have heard of some of this already. Um, Historically, economists have had quite a lot of different accounts of our happiness or well-being. Um, but recently, uh, by far the, the most popular one, the mainstream one, um, has been that there is really no way to compare happiness or well-being between different people, that it's meaningless or unscientific or, or just impossible. And this very cheery fellow, Jevons, uh, said it well quite a long time ago. The idea has been that every mind is inscrutable to every other mind, and no common denominator of feelings seems possible. Um, but more recently, people have started asking, again, very simply, the question, how are you feeling? For example, this on the European Social Survey. All things considered, how satisfied are you with your life as a whole nowadays on a scale of 0 to 10? Maybe take a couple of seconds and just think, how would you answer that question? And when we do ask a large number of people questions like that, we tend to come out with a distribution of answers that looks a bit like this. So we can see here that there's an encouraging kind of rightward bias here that we get a lot of 7 and 8s, Lots of people are pretty happy with how they feel, and, and that's nice. Um, and there are good reasons for thinking that we should take those answers moderately seriously. They're just questions, but they correlate very well with a lot of objective indicators of how people feel. So brain scans, levels of cortisol, um, heart rate, blood pressure, uh, smiling. Um, they, co they correlate too with some subjective indicators, such as recall of positive and negative events, um, or how other people say that the person answering feels. Um, and they're also a good predictor of how people will behave in future. If we take those measurements then and compare them with incomes, and particularly if we compare them with incomes at the level of a whole country, so this, this shows us the UK uh, GDP, so national income and life satisfaction over 30 years. And you can see that while GDP has gone up a whole lot, life satisfaction is really just flatlined. Um, and sort of in recognition of this, uh, Cameron in November, in fact, gave a, a very good speech where he committed the government to uh, to, to, to a much broader conception of, of what well-being means. He said that we'll start measuring our progress as a country not just by how our economy is growing, but how our lives are improving. Um, and, you know, it's a little bit late to the party. He quoted a lot from, from uh, a very, very inspiring speech given by Robert Kennedy in 1968, where Kennedy as well told us about all the different reasons why we should be looking beyond GDP when we're thinking about the progress of our, of our nations. Um, and one of the things that Kennedy noticed isn't included in GDP, and in fact, the pursuit of GDP at all costs could jeopardise, is the quality of our natural environment. So both positive things here, like green spaces, and negative things such as air pollution or noise. Um, intuitively, it feels reasonably obvious that our, our, our immediate environment is going to have an effect on our well-being. Um, but, you know, green space is lovely. We can all probably agree that green space is lovely. You know, great, wonderful. But the question is really, how lovely is it? What is the quantitative evidence that, that the, a nice environment makes us feel better? And, and more importantly, how much better does it make, it feel, make us feel? Um, and maybe it sounds a bit mean-spirited, insisting on numbers like this, but actually it really matters, because there are all kinds of things that are lovely and that we want more of. You know, we want education and healthcare, and I want gadgets, and there are all kinds of things that we want. And at some point, we don't have unlimited money, and we have to trade them off. And if we don't know what the effect is of each thing on how we feel, we're not going to make the best trade-off. And if we don't have any idea how something makes us feel, it's possible we're just kind of going to forget about it. So it's really important to know what the size of the effect of the environment is on our well-being. And perhaps surprisingly, we don't really know this all that well. Um, there's quite a small handful of papers looking specifically at this question of environmental effects on subjective well-being. Um, and even the papers that there are are not always ideal. So some of them uh, just take things on the level of whole countries. Um, and as we saw in actually the, the last TED video, there are problems with taking whole countries and with taking the means of things. Certainly the means, for example, of air pollution, it might be that no one's actually exposed to the mean of air pollution. People in cities might get a lot, people out cities might get not very much. So that's not great. Um, 
And some slightly more convincing studies look at individuals and they ask them how they feel nowadays and they look at environmental quality somewhere near the home. But they have to assume that it's only the home environment that matters. And often they don't know actually to any very um, detailed degree where people's homes actually are because they come from these very large surveys where maybe we have an electoral district or something um, as, the, as the spatial location of each respondent. So what if instead we could look not at whole countries or, or even individuals, but at individual experiences by individuals and look at people's well-being and environment right now as they're experiencing it. And studies of people's experience have been run before. Uh, in psychology, these are often known as experience sampling method studies. Um, and in the experience sampling method, uh, the researchers hand out notebooks or little mini computers to people. They beep the participants at, at random moments and they ask them about their experience and about the context of the experience. Um, ESM is great because you get no recall bias. You get a really accurate and detailed record of people's experiences. Um, and incidentally, a slightly different kind of record as well from what people recollect. And, and Kahneman gave an interesting TED talk about that last year. Um, and in the geek zone here, you also get longitudinal or panel data. You get many responses for each person. Um, when you're coming to do the analysis, that's quite exciting because it means that it's not a problem if different people are using the response scale differently. If I normally answer seven, but today I answer six, you normally answer three, but today you answer four. Despite the fact that your four is lower than my six, we know that that's happy for you and that six is not happy for me. And that's really powerful. Um, ESM studies have not been used a lot in environmental research, though, um, up to now. Um, and a typical ESM survey looks like this. And I think there's probably a couple of reasons why we haven't used them in the environment. The first thing is that this is a really big burden for the respondent. And it's also quite a big burden for the researcher who has to hand these out, get them filled in, and collect them all. Um, so the samples have been really small. So we'd have to have a really huge environmental effect for a sample that small to pick it up. And the second thing is that the location measures that we've tended to have, where are you, please be specific, are not really geared to working out exactly what the environment is in any kind of quantitative way. Um, you know, if only, if only someone would invent some kind of device that people had with them and that you could ask people questions at random times and you could know where they were. Well, as Steve Jobs liked to say, boom, the iPhone has made this a really great possibility. The iPhone has GPS, so we can tell exactly where it is. It has a camera, so we can record other aspects of the environment that it's in. Uh, it, it has these things, push notifications, so we can make it go beep for free. And it has an internet connection, so all this data can just be sent back effortlessly to, to our server. And there's millions of these things out there already in the country, um, just waiting to be used for research. Um, so a couple of years ago, I had this idea for Mappiness, which is an experience sampling method study, a, a simple one, um, using iPhones as, as the means of, of recording our data. About a year ago, I started programming it. And in the middle of August, I think about the time, same time this event started brewing, we launched. Um, you might spot a single problem with this. Perhaps the biggest problem is the people who own iPhones, um, myself among them, uh, who are not quite representative of the population as a whole. They're a bit younger, a bit richer, a bit better educated. And obviously, we only get the ones who are interested in the study, too. Um, and then in terms of experiences, we can't guarantee that every time we beep someone, they're immediately going to reply. Sometimes they don't have a connection. Sometimes they'll be driving. Sometimes they just aren't going to want to. So the sampling isn't perfect, but the data that we can get this way, I think, means that we can live with this limitation. And you know, as time goes on, more and more people will have phones like this. And, and phones similar to this that you know, are going to spread more widely, and the sample will become better. How does mappiness work? It's available on the App Store. It's free. I go and I download it. I open it up. And then I'm asked to register. And it, it takes a couple of minutes. I agree to take part. I give my age, gender, marital status, a couple of demographic questions. And I confirm when I'm going to be beeped. So then the default is twice a day from that moment on. I'll be beeped at a random moment and asked how I feel. And, and when I respond to that, I say how happy I'm feeling, how relaxed, and how awake on these sliding scales. I tell it who I'm with. Uh, I tell it whether I'm indoors, outdoors, in a vehicle. I tell it whether I'm uh, at home, at work, or somewhere else. And then I tell it on this list what sorts of things I'm doing. So I think at this moment I'm imagining that I'm in the pub and I'm chatting, I'm socialising and I'm, I'm drinking alcohol. And that all gets sent back to our server straight away. Um, and we're able to then start processing that. And if I wanted to, I could look at some breakdown, um, some, some sorts of charted breakdowns of my own happiness in, in this section here. Um, so who is it that's doing this? Um, is anyone here doing this? Yeah. Ah, that's nice to see. So... Um, at the time we launched, I typed this into the bottom of the website, and I said, our target is 3,000 people or more. And my big fear is that we'd get you know, a couple of dozen people for a couple of weeks, nothing actually that we could work with in, in terms of data. So this, this idea of a target of 3,000, I thought was some kind of crazy aspirational dream. Um, but I was fantastically wrong. 
Um, we got some really excellent coverage. Uh, we appeared on CNN on the front page of uh, some newspapers, uh, and we were really very lucky to get featured in Apple's App Store for two weeks. Um, and today, I think we're just over 32,500 people have signed up all time, um, and we're getting on towards 2 million responses. And that's just really an incredible data set that we can work with. And for each of those responses, we know where people are, how they're feeling, and all the things that we can attach to where they are, uh, which I'll deal with in a minute. And 32,000 people, um, I was going to say, is, is about the equivalent of the whole of Burgess Hill taking part in this study and, and responding more than 50 times each. So a lot of people. Um, but happily, they're not all in Burgess Hill because that wouldn't give us very much variation. Um, this shows where people were about a month in. Um, the darker the colour, the more people. It's logarithmic, so that's quite an extreme difference. And you can see that there are definitely more people in, in urban centres. But we have a reasonable coverage of the country as a whole, and obviously this has got better in, in the last few months too, so that's nice. Um, and finally, uh, I just want to talk a little bit about what we're finding out from this data. Uh, and I'm going to give a short example, uh, looking at how happiness has varied over time, which admittedly is not mapping happiness <laughs> over space, but I think it's interesting. Uh, and then I'll talk a bit more about our first steps at looking how, how happiness is varying across space. Um, you might have seen this Monday, that this Monday was officially the most depressing day of the year, Blue Monday. Um, but you might also have seen on Twitter or elsewhere uh, that ben, ben Goldacre, who, who writes The Guardian's bad science column, has not been very taken with the, with the quality of, uh, of the research behind this. In fact, it's, it's PR bullshit, apparently. Um, so it occurred to me that we could use the mapping data to see, well, what's the truth, at least for our iPhone-owning participants. So this is a chart showing average happiness by day since about the middle of September to this Monday. Um, weekends are green. Weekends are generally happier. Uh, weekdays are blue, uh, generally less happy. The first thing I think that really leaps out of this is Christmas Day is incredibly happy. Um, people love Christmas Day, followed by Boxing Day, followed, I think, by New Year's Day, uh, and then maybe New Year's Eve. Um, so that's interesting. And then the next thing is that Blue Monday here, which uh, confusingly is not in blue, uh, but is in yellow. Um, I've drawn a line across from that so that we can compare Blue Monday with a lot of the days that have come before it. Uh, and actually, you'll see that there are lots of days that are less happy than Blue Monday. Uh, so Blue Monday really does seem to be a bit of a myth. Um, and we can do some slightly cleverer things with this to take account of the fact that people who are responding now are not the same people that were responding in September. They could be different, um, and they could be different in a sort of systematic way. And also to take account for the fact that people now have been taking part for a different amount of time than they have been in September. Uh, and actually, we find that over time, people's happiness responses go up as they're taking part in happiness. Um, but we can control for both of those things, and this, this effect is still true. There are still plenty of days, particularly Mondays and Tuesdays, over the last few months. Um, so there's a small reason to be cheerful today. Things aren't as bad as you've been told this week. Um, I'm now looking across space. This map shows the average happiness response by uh, an area of varying size, depending on how many responses we had in that area. Um, and you can explore this map uh, on, a, on a kind of Google map background uh, with this link that I put down there in the bottom left. Um, and I've zoomed in here, actually, on the Brighton area. So you can see that where we are at the moment in the center, I think, is sort of fairly middling for happiness. Um, I'm actually not sure that you can make very much of this map, and part of the problem is that the aggregation level is still too high. There's a lot of different environments in each of these squares. And what we're really interested in doing is not looking so much at specific places, even though that's kind of fun, but looking at what types of places make people happiest and least happy. And the way that we can do that is we can use uh, some big spatial data sets. So this is called the, the Land Cover Map 2000, and this shows London. And it tells you roughly what the land cover is uh, in each of uh, millions and millions of 25 meter squares across the whole country. So black here says it's con a continuous urban environment. And you can see against that for London, the Thames in blue and Hyde Park over here is a mixture of uh, forest and grass and various other things. Um, now, the other question is that when people go into the countryside or to the park, for example, uh, they probably do that in a particular situation and to do particular things. Um, for example, if I'm going to the park, it's likely that it's the weekend, I'm with friends, and I'm going to have a picnic or do something nice. So if we want to know what the effect of the park is, we need to control for those things. And we can do that because we ask those questions when we beat people. Odds are also that it's a sunny day, um, and we also probably therefore want to control for that. And we can do that because we know where and when people are responding, and we can match up with weather data from all these weather stations and get a really good idea of what the weather conditions were like at the time. We then put this all into a great big regression model where we try and look at happiness as a function of the habitat, the activity, who they're with, all these other things that we're controlling for, and individual fixed effects for any geeks who know what that means, which is a nice thing. Um, and then here are some of our results. 
On these results, the scale down the left is how big the effect is on people's happiness if we scale that happiness from 0 to 100. Um, and that's what you see in these little central dots. These are the coefficients from the regression. So, for example, walking or hiking makes two people 2.5 two points happier on a 100-point scale. The bars around them are confidence intervals. And if those cross zero, then we think this effect's not significant. It doesn't really mean anything. Uh, but lots of our effects don't cross zero because we have such a great big sample. So we can see here that walking and hiking, which potentially is probably outdoors, is great. So is gardening, so is bird watching, so is sports, running, and exercise. Not many people in our sample are hunting and fishing, so we can't say very much about that. Um, in terms of weather, which we're controlling for too, uh, rain makes people a bit less happy. Uh, wind speeds are not good, higher temperatures are good. And you might be saying, big deal, this is kind of obvious, right? I'm, I'm not telling you that people are happiest with a flu in Slough on a Tuesday. But um, the great thing again about this is that we get real numbers, we get to kind of compare the different sizes of effects from, from different things. Um, finally, the one that we're most interested in, I guess, is, is the environment when people are outdoors in that environment. Um, and in this one, the baseline is when people are in continuous urban, so that's what zero means. And you can see that almost every environment except the continuous urban environment is better than the continuous urban environment. Uh, in particular, marine and coastal margins, mountains, moors and heathlands, and coniferous woodlands are all particularly happy. They, they add sort of four to five points after we've controlled for what people are doing and the weather and the time of day and so on. So that's really interesting. Um, this research is, is going on. Um, we've got a lot more to do still at kind of characterising the size of the effects and what that means. But I think that this, this technique and, and this kind of technology um, has got a huge amount of promise for working out uh, what makes people happy and what makes people unhappy, and therefore helping us make individual and social choices that ultimately will make us a lot happier. Thank you.